I contacted all the studios. And I said, okay, the Hollywood premiere is a basic part of Hollywood. They don't exist anymore. You don't see premieres anymore. Big searchlights and all this stuff. But that to me, in my mind, Hollywood was, the, the image was the great Hollywood premiere with the searchlights illuminating the sky. That's what I grew up with as a child. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to find it. And I contacted the publicity departments of the studios whenever they were having a, a, a premiere or something going on, like uh, the uh, Princess Margaret was going to the Universal Studio lots to meet Alfred Hitchcock. So I contacted them and I said, hi, and I used the premise of Monte Carlo TV, which I think I've said in an earlier interview. I said, I'm filming for Monte Carlo TV and uh, we'd like to film the visit of Princess Margaret to the studio. Oh, fine, you'll have passes waiting. The industry is very interested in getting exposure. Did you start out to make a musical film, or did it just make sense as you went along? People had music. They made music of their own. There are people in the film who composed their own music. Louis Beach Marvin composed, plays the piano, and sings his own songs, such as Killer Heroes. We murder, we crush, we annihilate. We want to win. We kill to win as individuals, as a nation. We must win. We must win. And in winning, we lose our souls. There were songs that I wrote, for example, The Last Wave of the Day. Now, when I say I wrote, I wrote the lyrics. Mike Curb the music director, we would sit next to each other on the piano bench and I would say, okay, I've written these lyrics which kind of have a rhyming feel to them. This is my idea of a melody. He would say, well, let's try this melody. And we were working back and forth. But I, uh, all the lyrics that are not credited specifically to other people, such as to Murray Schwimmer or to Louis Beach Marvin, mm. I wrote. Okay. okay, And I wrote them to try to capture the feeling. The Golden Afternoon, mm -hmm. with all this, the sequences of the surfing and the sailboats and my own daughter in a swing at the age of two and a half, ah. Diana. I wrote that song, The Golden Afternoon, and it was performed by my late wife, by my, my wife Helene, uh, uh, who's since deceased, who was a coloratura soprano, because I wanted to write a song that captured the feeling of the afternoon in Southern California, the beautiful sun-drenched afternoon, uh, children playing, people enjoying themselves, and I tried to capture that uh, in that song. Uh, that, you might say, was not, uh, that was my expressionism. Okay. documentary-wise, was in that so that song. was your story? Yeah, my story, the Hollywood, the City of Dreams, is my express form of expression. The freeways, the Hollywood signs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Golden Afternoon is my form of uh, uh, docu documenting the city while expressing my feelings about it in music. In other cases, people doing what they wanted me to see, film them doing, speaking about what they were doing, and then writing their own music, which they said they'd like to use in their sequence. All of the disparate lifestyles that you show and depict uh, seem to coexist relatively peacefully, watch right aside. Um, you didn't seem to focus on conflict as much as variety. This is not just people in the film, in the film business. This is people... Oh, from all, all walks yeah, of life. Yeah, but everyone in the film came from someplace. Nobody was born in Hollywood. That's interesting. They all came from different parts of the United States to live in Hollywood and choose to, chose to stay there. Conflict, the, the conf had I been there with a the camera while, when conflict was taking place, I would have filmed it. Okay. You show Richard Alpert, who would later become Ram Dass, Baba Ram Dass, and he's giving a lecture about taking LSD. Was LSD legal at that time? Marijuana was illegal, heroin was illegal. I don't remember if amphetamines were legal in 65, they might have been, but LSD certainly was not. As psilocybin and other things were being used experimentally. Dr. Uh, Janiger 
and other psychologists were experimenting with it, and I knew people who had taken it, the prominent people in the, in the motion picture business. Oh, well, Cary Grant. Who had taken it to like open up their imagination. The fascinating thing about the whole drug culture is that even though I had not intended to focus on the drug culture, it became difficult to point the camera at somebody and not come upon some aspect of the drug culture. Such as, oh, Bob, we're going to have a party at the home of Mr. and Mrs. White. He's the former chief pharmacist of L.A. Mm -hmm. Well, I go to his nice home there in Hancock Park, and Mr. White, who answers the door wearing his kepi, his, his Shriner's cap, right? <laughs> Uh, he said to me, uh, oh, Mr. Cohen, uh, you know, uh, uh, I used to be the chief pharmacist of the city, and I still do favors for friends. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, in case you're ever in pain and you need some large supply of pharmaceuticals, I can get it for you directly from the factory in those big boxes, 144 bottles to a box. I've got a friend, a, a nurse, she was in an auto accident, she's in pain, and, you know, uh, I help her out, and I help out friends of mine in the community. So I said, well, what the man is telling me is that he can get me drugs out of prescription in large quantities, and he used to be the chief pharmacist of the city of LA. Okay? This is not an acid-popping freak. Mm -hmm. This is the establishment. The drug culture runs from children on the street, teenagers taking drugs, to well-established pillars of the community. Yep. Some of the characters that seem the most far out, if you will, uh, like Gypsy Boots and and even uh, Vito, um, probably are living what is now considered the green lifestyle and, and uh, health food and, and juices. And yeah, Gypsy Boots, anti-drug. Vito, anti-drug. Mm -hmm. Respectable people. I can get you drugs. You know, I mean, it was very interesting. Right. A combination the the way the whole thing worked, and yet there was a, that became a motif running through the whole thing.